of verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul begins this letter he's writing to this church that, that he uh, founded, um, or at least he established, uh, we can read about that in the book of Acts, of course, but, but uh, Paul went there, uh, spent a couple of years, and revival broke out, heaven broke out, and in two years' time, the whole of Asia Minor had heard uh, the Word of God. And so he's writing back to them ten years after that revival. He's sitting in a prison as he writes this. And so he goes on to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So last week we, we, we focused on that one verse, really, and we talked about the, the uh, wonderful riches that we have as God's people. We're rich. We are rich. And uh, it may not necessarily be a material thing, but spiritually speaking, every blessing is available to us uh, through Christ Jesus. So from the Spirit, from the heavenly realm, we can draw everything that we need to be what God's called us to be. And so if we come up short, it's certainly not on God that we failed or we didn't make it. It's going to be on us that we did not make ourselves, uh, uh, you know, we didn't avail ourselves of everything that he makes uh, available to us. And Jesus did that for us. He, uh, he made that possible for us by going to that cross and, and dying there and shedding his blood uh, to, to remedy the sin problem. And then, of course, he was raised up from the dead. It's almost like somebody, uh, uh, you know, somebody very wealthy uh, making a will. And in that will, leaving everything uh, to someone. And then dying, but coming back from the dead to make sure that the will uh, is being put into uh, effect. And so really that's what Jesus has done for us. And so tonight we have available to us this amazing inheritance that's ours. And, and so we can claim, lay claim to everything that God has promised us. So what we're going to look at now as we get a little deeper into chapter 1, and we could spend, we could spend several nights just going through these first uh, 14 verses here. Uh, uh, there's one blessing after another that he tells us about. And so he's, he's letting us know why we're rich. He's letting us know what, what, what is ours and, and, and how wonderful it is. And like I say, you could, you could just take this apart and spend a great deal of time going through it. But, but we just want to give a good overview here tonight. First of all, in verse 4 now, as we press on, he says, Just as he chose, in, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So let me read that again. Just as, and this is, once again this connects it to the previous statement that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. Just as He chose us in Him. You and I are chosen in Him. And it was done before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So, let, so let's focus on this for just a minute. We can say this, He has chosen us. God the Father. We can look at these first, oh, the first um, few verses here as, as blessings from the Father. So we're going to see how the Trinity all plays into this. But, but God the Father has chosen us. And He chose us from before the creation of the world. So it really begins with us. It didn't begin with, oh, God's going, you know, God just kind of, you know, had a, a day where he felt real creative and so he, he decided he was going to, you know, make the universe. And, oh, you know, what would be nice is if we could put uh, people in here. That, that's not how it worked. He, God wanted children and so the creation is the home he made for us to live in. But it all begins with us. And so we want to put ourselves in that us. We are that us. So before God 
created the things that he created that we, we marvel at in the, in the, in the universe. He, he wanted an us. He decided that he wanted a me and a you. And so uh, that's what it's all about here. So God chose us and he chose you and me before he ever created anything. So we're, we're, we were in the mind of God in eternity. Okay, in eternity past, if you will, if we can use that expression. So in eternity past, God chose you. He wanted a you. And so you are part of God's eternal plan. Amen. Now that, that should boggle your mind. You, you should be blown away by that. You should be completely, totally blown away that God would foreknow you. He knew who you would be. He knew what you would be like. He knew your re rebellion if you know if you were somebody that fought him and resisted him and sinned greatly against him and, and all of that. He knew all of that was coming, but in his grace, he still wanted a you. Okay? So it's 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 a grace thing. And and so he so he chose us in him, in Christ. So from the beginning, we can also say that, that Jesus was already going to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So in His grace, part of Him warning us is that Jesus would be our Savior. So we're not looking at plan B here. Really, uh, you could say it's a rescue plan, but really all of, uh, all of what God has done to this point has been plan A for Him. Okay? He just didn't happen to kind of, you know, well, let's have a council here and figure out how we can fix man now. Uh, he already knew what was going on and knew what he was going to do. And so, so the good news is he chose us. He picked us out. He selected us. Uh, Jesus said, you did, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So this choosing goes back into, uh, into that eternity that, once again, we, we hardly can begin to comprehend. But, but it's, it, it, he, he chose us, and it's all in Christ. It's not in ourselves. You're not chosen because you did something. You're not chosen because you necessarily deserve it or are worthy of it. That's not why you're in the eternal plan of God. God chose you to be in His eternal plan. Okay? So, so we, need to, we need to focus on that. And, and how all of that works, I don't know, uh, in terms of election and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff that kind of comes up with some people. But we don't care about that. We're not going to get into some sort of argument or debate or uh, work deep into the weeds of theology on how God brings us to himself and how, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So we'll go on now to verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. All right, now, once again, we have another one of those big, uh, what, what's made into a big theological word that then becomes uh, a debate for folks, um, and that's predestination. But we've been predestined to adoption as sons. Predestination usually doesn't have uh, so much to do with people as it does with purposes. Okay? Now, I say that because there's a lot of folks today that believe predestination means that God chose some to be saved and some to be lost. Some are saved, some are lost. That was locked in at the beginning. So that, that's part of that uh, theological stuff I was telling you about to begin with. We, we don't believe that. We believe this includes everybody. God's will was not that anybody would perish. So I can't imagine anybody thinking that God was okay from the beginning that uh, people would go to hell and then that would bring him glory somehow or another. Uh, we, we're, not, we're not Calvinists here. We are Armenians here. So we, we are in a whole different camp uh, from those folks that believe that sort of thing. But we're predestined to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And so predestination then once again has to do with the purpose that God has for us. In eternity past, God considered you saved from the beginning. He considered you saved. He didn't see you as a lost person. He didn't see anybody out there as lost. 
He knew that, certainly he knew that was going to be a possibility. He knew that that would happen because he foreknows. But, but that was not his plan. The plan of God was not that people would be lost. His plan was that everyone would be saved through Jesus Christ. That's the plan. And it would be, of course, a big part of that would be this adoption uh, as, as, as sons and daughters. Uh, when we say a pre, when we when we talk about adoption as sons here, he's talking about being placed into a position of a firstborn son, the double portion. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about but about a work that was done in the Roman world where someone was made an heir, uh, given an inheritance, but done but that was done as an adult. Okay. He's not talking about an adoption going out uh, into the orphanage and, and choosing uh, a baby or a child to adopt, to bring into your family. The adoption here, adoption doesn't bring you into salvation. Adoption doesn't bring you into the family of God. You are born again into the family of God. Adoption refers to your being placed into a position where you, you are now qualified for the inheritance. Okay? So we are, we are firstborn sons in that regard. Now, now why, is that necessary? why is that important for us to understand? Because when God, when God saves you, you don't grow into your inheritance. You are immediately qualified to receive your inheritance. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you're, you're not going to grow into it. In Galatians, Paul talks about how you know you have to grow into it, and there has to be tutors, and the Old Testament was the was the the, the the one that uh, taught. Uh, we're, we're not, we, we skip all of that, praise God. So in grace, because of His grace, and because of what Jesus has done, adoption through Christ, we're brought into this sonship. You understand that now? Not brought into life. That was, that's a born again experience. We're brought into sonship through this wonderful adoption. And so that's how you can be rich. So I literally was a pauper, uh, I was poor, I, I was a beggar, spiritually speaking, when I was lost, but the instant I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I became rich. Amen. I'm, a, I'm a joint heir with Christ, hallelujah, and an heir of God, right away, praise God. So thank the Lord for that. So that's the plan. So in eternity past, the Father, can, in His mind, I'm saved. And then Jesus... For, for, for Christ, when He came, He considers us saved, of course, what, what, when, what He did when He died for us on the cross and said it's finished. And so etern in eternity past, we were considered saved. Historically, in the past, we were considered saved. But when the Holy Spirit comes, He considers us saved when He convicts us and we yield to it and we take Jesus as our Savior. And that's our present experience. Yes. Okay? So salvation covers everything. Amen. It, it began in eternity and it's fulfilled in the present and continues for eternity. So salvation's been going on in the mind of God before He ever created a thing. Wow. Well, like I said, you can get in some deep waters here and, and swim around in some, some grace here, okay? And just, we should be awed at the amazing God that has saved us. So we have this amazing plan that he has for us. He's the eternal architect of that plan. And for you and I, we are here to be made into what he has chosen for us to be. And so we, we want to choose what he has chosen. Yeah. Okay? We want to choose his plan. So that's why uh, I think Ephesians is so important and so powerful as we can get an insight. We get a, we get a window opened into uh, the, the plan of God and we can see it. We, you know, we'll talk about that more in just a few minutes. Amen. And so we're, so we're, we're given an adult standing so we can be rich today. Hallelujah. And then as we read on, uh, verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Uh, this is uh, this is from the New King James, uh, and some of the modern translations it doesn't say except it says we're blessed in the beloved. Either way, it works. But uh, I would say to you that we are accepted in Christ. 
today. Once again, I told you, I think I forget how many times he mentions in him, I think it's 27 times just in the book of Ephesians, that he mentions us being in Christ. But we understand tonight, Christ is accepted by the Father. Christ is accepted by the Father. Uh, and if we're in Christ, our acceptance comes because He accepts Christ and He accepts us in Christ. Amen. So I'm accepted. I'm not trying to get accepted tonight. I'm not trying to be worthy tonight. I'm not trying to be deserving tonight of His grace. I am accepted in Christ. If I'm not accepted, if I don't feel accepted in that before God, then I'm saying something wrong with Christ. Or I've stepped out of Christ. In Christ I'm accepted. In Christ I can boldly or confidently come into the presence of the Father. Yeah. Amen. And I may have messed up, sinned horribly. But I'm, I've got confidence to come before that throne to receive mercy. That's the first thing you can get when you get there. Is mercy. So we don't have to fear going to the Father. No matter what we've done or where we're at, we can, we can confidently go knowing that He's going to be merciful to us and give us grace to help us in that time of need. What is grace? It's us getting what we don't deserve, but we need. Grace. Amen. Thank God for grace tonight. I don't know where we would be without His grace, but we're accepted in the beloved hallelujah so no matter what anybody thinks of you they may not like you god does people you may not seem loved god loves you you may not seem accepted but god accepts you amen so as we rest in that it'll it'll hopefully it'll even, uh, heal some of the rejection and maybe some of the low self-esteem that we might have praise god he loves us and accepts us no matter what so, so the blessings that flow out of the Father uh, are what we've just talked about. But now let's talk about the blessings that flow from the Son. Jesus, one of the, the first blessings is He's redeemed us. Notice verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood. We have redemption through His blood. Redeem means to purchase and to set free. Uh, it could also mean for, for there to be a ransom paid to free someone. Uh, in the uh, days of, uh, of Christ, there's something like 60 million people at that time that would be slaves in that Roman Empire. S slaves. So people could be bought and, uh, 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 and, and you know, like property. And so what, what the picture here is of, of someone coming and, and buying someone with the, with, the, with the view of releasing them from their bondage, to, to set them free. It was to buy a slave, and, and once purchasing them, then giving them their freedom, which was very possible to be done. And so for us, then, the picture is Christ came and died on the cross for us, took our place, took all the wrath of God, took everything that we deserved, everything we were worthy of, okay? The, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus took that on himself at Calvary, okay? And, and that became the price that was sufficient to free us. The Father accepted that as the price paid in full for our freedom. So we've been redeemed. We've been bought out of sin. It's power. It's penalty. We've been bought out of the authority of Satan. He's not our master anymore. Okay? We've been set free from it. We've been set free from the law of Moses. We've been set free. And set free so that we could then become uh, uh, the children of God. But we've been set free tonight. So we've been redeemed through His blood. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Once again, slaves aren't rich. Did you know that slaves don't have any right to uh, uh, property or money or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, but God wanted us to be rich. So He set us free from slavery and made us His children. He adopted us into His family and made us inheritors 
uh, of uh, what he's promised us. And so the blood was, was enough. It, it satisfied God. So always remember that. Your works don't satisfy God's requirement for sin. Baptism doesn't do it. Going to church three times a week doesn't do it. Paying your tithes doesn't do it. None of that is what releases you from sin, Satan, and self. It's the blood of Jesus. And that's it. Period. But Jesus yeah. paid the price. So we don't want to add to anything. Add to that. We don't want to try to add to what God has done for us. Amen? So when we rest in it, that's, that's what brings the transformation into our life. And, and uh, so just like, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking about tonight, I get to come to church. It's not that I have to come to church. I get to come to church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. And I'm thankful for that. And then he goes on to say that forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Now forgiveness here comes from a word that means to carry away. Okay? It can also have the uh, meaning of dismissal or cancellation. And it kind of gives us a picture here of Christ as the scapegoat. Now if you're familiar with, the, with what was required by Israel, once a year what they would do is the, the priest, the high priest would, would take two goats. They were called the scapegoats. Now one he would sacrifice and, and, and use its blood uh, in, uh, in a ceremony there. But the other goat would be taken and the high priest would, would place his hands on the head of that goat and pronounce all the sins of Israel on it. And then they would take that goat way out into the middle of nowhere and turn it loose. And that goat would never be seen again. It was the scapegoat. Okay? He, that goat became responsible for all the sins of Israel. That goat became the one that, that, took, that paid the price for the sins of Israel. That separation from God. To be lost. Wow, isn't that a wonderful picture? Uh, of, of us, of our salvation. It's too bad for the goat, but but um, and, and, but once again, what you're looking at is a picture of what Christ has done for us. He's died for our sins and His blood became that price. And then He became that scapegoat where He took for us that separation. But here's the thing. That goat took their sins out into the wilderness and disappeared with them. And so that's the picture we have here. Jesus took our sins and carried them away from us. He took them away. It's like his cousin John uh, said about him when he saw him, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus, as our scapegoat, takes our sins away. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions. Psalm 103 and 12. Okay, sin makes us poor, but grace makes us rich. <coughs> So sin has been dealt with at Kevin. Okay, uh, verse 8. Which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So another blessing that we have is that He has revealed the will of God to us. He's revealed to us the plan of God, the purpose of God. He's, he's, he's shown us what the mystery is. Now mystery here can be translated a sacred secret. And it's a sacred secret that, that listen, we're in God's inner circle now that we're born again. Amen. We're, 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 we're uh, uh, in, his, in his inner circle and now he shares with us what his plan is. Amen. Thank God for that. We, you and I understand so far tonight just what we've talked about. We've been let in on the plan of God. The eternal purpose of God. The eternal plan of God. And we're right in the middle of it. And it's all about Jesus. Jesus is at the center of of God's plan. Everything in the end is going to be about Jesus. Amen. People that don't want to hear about Jesus, that's unfortunate because in the end, that's what it's all going to be about. You're either going to bow the knee or, or confess with your tongue or else. But, but that's, that's, that's the plan of God. He's raised His Son Jesus up that everything and everybody would confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. 
And so it's all about Jesus. So we, you can't make enough about Jesus. You, you, can't get, you can't get crazy enough about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. And he's worthy and deserving. He has given and made us an inheritance. Verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Hallelujah. Uh, being predestined according to the purposes of him who works all things according to to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So let's focus on the inheritance. There's a lot there, now, but let's just focus on the, that we've obtained an inheritance in Christ. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. And you can kind of look at it, and, and, and they say that in the language, this could mean either we are an inheritance or we receive an inheritance. Uh, one way or the other. Uh, so if we look at it as we are an inheritance for the Son, that the, God, that the Father's given to the Son, then you can see how the, in that how valuable we must be to Him. That He would die for us, that he would, that he would literally send His Son to die for us that we would become that inheritance. So that tells us how valuable we would be. But we also have an inheritance. We're part of the inheritance. Either way, you and I are part of an inheritance. And we get an inheritance uh, in, in Christ. And so uh, the Son is a gift to us, and we're a gift to His Son. Amen. But listen, it all, all of it involves us. Could be called, listen, we're heirs of God being joint heirs with Jesus. Jesus gets His inheritance with us. So without us, He doesn't get His inheritance. And so we're part of that inheritance uh, uh, that God uh, has uh, uh, granted, quite frankly, for himself, really. And then at la lastly, we'll look at the blessings that we have from the Holy Spirit. And this, this brings us into the presence. This brings us into uh, our present experience. Verse 13 says, In him, in Christ, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, we could talk about salvation here. You understand that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People hear the gospel, they respond to the gospel by trusting in Jesus. And what happens when that takes place is that the Spirit of God comes to seal the person. In Christ. So we become sealed by the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, let me just say that every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, or you would not be a believer. You would not be a Christian, according to Romans 8 and verse 9, if you did not have within you the presence of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean you're necessarily baptized in or filled with. That, that's a whole different sermon here for us, but. Uh, another lesson, but, but for us, the Spirit of God comes to dwell in us. And so when we start talking about the sealing of the Holy Spirit, it begins with the Holy Spirit coming to live in us. Now what does that mean? To be sealed with the Holy Spirit. Well, first of all, a seal here, primarily what you're talking about is a stamp. It, 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 was, it was wax that would be applied and then usually what would happen is the the owner of something that was buying something or was sealing something to market had a seal on a signet ring. And what he would do is he would press that into that wax and it would give it a very distinctive seal. It's like, in, you know, even today you can, if you got something, um, if you were to get something, uh, what do you call it, notarized, okay, uh, you would have a seal, I'm sure, that would be stamped into that, that distinctive seal, marking that, and this is another picture, it's, it's legitimate. This is genuine. This is checked out. Ooh, well, there's another picture for us of what being sealed with the Holy Spirit. But that seal is applied. And so it implies, first of all, that there's been a finished transaction. So if, if somebody's going to buy something, they'll say they're going to buy, uh, I, I don't know what, you know, maybe it's a deed to land. That seal indicates that what has what has necessarily been done for it has been done. What, what has been paid was enough 
and then it's been sealed. There's a stamp of approval that's placed on it. So there's a finished transaction. We all know when Jesus went to the cross and, and died for us and then was resurrected from the dead, that's where our salvation is. So that's been done. Amen. Uh, uh, that, that part of it has been uh, finished. But it implies ownership. It implies ownership. A price has been paid. That price was enough. And so uh, the person then takes ownership of that property. And so for us, because Jesus has paid the price for us, we become the, the property, if you will, of God. He now, we now belong to Him. Uh, reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. So I know I belong to God. What I do now matters with my body, my spirit, my soul, my mind, whatever. I belong to God. I, God I'm, I am personally, you know, obligated to honor the Lord who's bought me out of slavery. Mm -hmm. Amen? And I willingly become a bondservant uh, of God through Jesus Christ. But here's the other thing. I'm now marked as belonging to God. So when the devil comes around, I get done with you. I don't belong to you anymore. You don't have a right to tell me anything uh, or to, to, to make me do anything. I belong to God. I am marked, sealed, the seal of God. The image of God is on me. That's another picture we could, we could explore. But we have that seal on us. It implies uh, safety and protection, certainly from the enemy. But we are also, uh, uh, listen, uh, when, G when Jesus comes to take His church, it's those who have the seal, who are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that seals us as God's people. Okay? And it also, as I said a, a few minutes ago, it's a mark of uh, authenticity. We're genuine. We're the real deal. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in me. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit in me marks me as this thing being legitimate. It's not that I go to church. That's good. A lot of folks go to church that the Holy Spirit ain't in them. A lot of folks do good works and, look, and it looks good. A lot of folks are talking good talk. But it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's not for us to judge necessarily. But, but it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes us legit. And then our last thing here is he has given us a down payment. Notice, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Notice that he's the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Guarantee. Guarantee would mean in that day and time it would make reference to a down payment that was given. A down payment to guarantee the final purchase of property. So if, uh, you know, you make a down payment, usually, very often, you receive what it is you're making the down payment on. And, and you receive it. And so what God has done is He has said uh, to us, uh, it's not time yet for me to completely redeem you, completely save you, okay? Because there's some things that have to happen. But when my son comes, you're going to be resurrected and glorified and be with me forever. That's the, that, you see, is the purchased, that's the purchased possession that we are to him. In his mind, once again, in eternity, he already, saw, he, he already sees us as saved, glorified, his children living in the city for square, uh, you know, his forever. Okay? And so he's saying, here, I'm going, to, I'm going to put within you a down payment. I'm going to invest in my future with you by while we're waiting for things to, to completely finish out here, I'm going to put my Holy Spirit, I'm going to put part of me into you. Okay? Turn that. Sound system. Okay, let's go. Devil, you're a liar. 
But he puts in us a little piece of heaven sometimes to get to heaven on. Uh, but he puts within us his presence uh, as, as a down payment, a first installment to guarantee that he will finish the work. Hallelujah. So we have within us this, this wonderful uh, uh, you know, presence that he is going to redeem us completely and totally. You can read about that in... Um, Romans chapter 8. Oh yeah, let's let me read this. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So as our body, so he's talking about that resurrection, that glorification that is to come. Now, I also understand this, that even today in the Greek, this word would mean engagement ring. It's an engagement ring. So when somebody promises to marry someone, they give them an engagement ring. Okay? And so what the Holy Spirit is in our lives is a promise, a love promise. It's not just a property thing. It's a love promise that the, the bridegroom makes to the bride that... I am going to come and, and, and claim you as my own. And so that's the other, uh, another picture we can have of this guarantee. How wonderful this is. Yes. Amen. We, we could spend a lot of time in some of these things. But, but let's bring it to conclusion. Here's some things we need to uh, take from this. First of all, true riches come from God. Yes. Mm -hmm. True riches come from God. What? Well, What's in this world will fade away. Rust can be stolen and fade away. But what, what, what? But the real true riches come from God. What you and I have in Christ, money can't buy. Money cannot buy. And so we enjoy these gifts because uh, uh, we know that they come from a God who loves us. Amen. And He has made promises to us that He will fulfill. The second thing is all these riches come by God's grace and His glory. How many times do we see as we read through this in verse 6, it says, uh, to the praise of the, of the glory of God. In verse 12, it says uh, that we should be to the praise of His glory. Verse 14, same thing, to the praise of His glory glory. All of this has purpose. All of this has purpose. Um, God didn't save you to get you out of hell. God saved you so that you could live to His glory. Amen. So we, we're saved for a purpose. And it's in us that He reveals to everyone in the Spirit and on earth. Okay? And under the earth. He uses us to reveal His love and His grace. And then, of course, these riches are just the beginning. We're, you know, we're just, you know, sometimes I think, I'm just learning what's mine in Christ. There's so much more for us to discover. So much more for us to receive and, and, to, and to enjoy. And, and I believe for eternity, we're going to be uh, marveling at the riches of God and getting deeper and deeper into what God has for us. And so, let's praise Him. Let's give Him glory. Let's give Him honor uh, because of all that He has done for us. Amen. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of the glory that we would give to Him.